uh, either email you directly or contact you and, and answer those, those, those questions. So let me just give a big sort of strategic view of why we're here and what we're on about for those people who may not be quite uh, across uh, the detail. Uh, the, the Common Mission Project is a not-for-profit here in Australia. It's part of an international uh, network of uh, similar organisations in the UK and the USA and continuing to grow. And what we're really on about is empowering mission-driven entrepreneurs to solve pressing uh, national security and um, defence type uh, challenges. And we do that through principally a methodology developed by Steve, and we'll, we'll talk to Steve shortly, called Lean Launchpad, which is applying startup uh, technologies or startup ways of thinking to solve uh, problems. Pretty exciting program. Uh, it's scaled pretty significantly in the United States, moving towards 50 universities next year. And the ambition in uh, the UK is around 24 universities in the next couple of years. And I think in Australia, we can, with you know some concerted effort, we could probably track towards 12 or so universities applying this type of training program for students to work with government sponsors in the next next few years. And that's the opportunity that we all have uh, together. Um, so uh, as you join, if you want to just make sure you're on uh, mute, I think we've now, we're about 60 people. Uh, and it'd be good if you have your, your camera on so we can see your face, that's always nice. Um, just also be aware we are recording today's session. We'll make today's recording available to people who weren't able to join us uh, due to a conflict in their schedule and we, we might use it uh, a bit later on. So without any further ado, we'll, we'll, we'll get on with um, our dialogue and our discussion. It's really great to see so many people, so many old friends and some new friends along the way. So we'll start off by just um, um, introduce you to Steve Blank. So for those who don't know Steve, Steve, um, maybe you talk Steve, so you pop into everyone's window and they can see uh, who you are. Um, so thanks for having me, Jamie. Uh, great to be here. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Steve. So jo Steve's joined us from you're in your ranch there in uh, just outside of Palo Alto. Um, so Steve Blank, for people who are not aware, Steve Blank is widely acknowledged as the, the father or the founder of the, the lean startup movement. Uh, Steve's a serial entrepreneur, um, uh, a number of exits and following a very successful career. Uh, in and around the valley, um, transitioned into Stanford, where he started thinking about um, what was the system behind his his success, and that led to the Lean Launchpad, the book Four Steps to Epiphany, um, the Epiphany, and multiple other sort of uh, books and activities and blogs and all that really corrals this energy behind this movement. But Steve's also a veteran, uh, served. Um, in Thailand during the Vietnam War, supporting uh, aircraft um, flying missions, uh, and has also spent some time working uh, in Australia. So with that, Steve, um, you know you know Australia, and you know you're the co-founder of the Lean Startup Movement. But tell us more about Hacking for Defence. What's the background about Hacking for Defence, which underpins the Common Mission Project? Well, Jamie, as as you described, uh, you know, hacking for defense came out of about three or four different areas for me personally, and I'll let Pete and Joe also uh, talk about the uh, about their motivations. But number one, as as you mentioned, I was a veteran uh, uh, in the United States and uh, had watched as we ended uh, national military service in the U.S. And so we had run a and still running a forty plus year science experiment of what happened in our country when we disconnected most of the body populace from any skin in the game in foreign policy. Um, and, and the results I don't think have been pretty um, with a series of perpetual wars without um, much engagement from the rest of the population. Um, you know, the second is I, I teach at Stanford and I've taught at other uh, research universities where most of my students uh, had no knowledge and would never have any intersection with the government. And if they had any thoughts about the government or the uh, our Department of Defense, it, it, they typically weren't pleasant. Um, and third is, it was clear that, uh, uh, at least to me and obviously to others, that massive changes were uh, occurring outside in technology and, and uh, geopolitics that were affecting the Department of Defense. And uh, it, it was clear that their existing systems um, 
existing technologies, existing processes uh, could probably use some fresh thinking from maybe some students and, and talent they would never uh, able to get access to. Uh, and that was all in the back of my mind uh, until I met uh, Pete Newell and Joe Felter, who had started a company called BMMT. Um, and I had already started a national program in the US called i -Corps, or the Innovation Corps with an, our National Science Foundation, um, which got a, a version here, uh, uh, was, was adopted by David Bird at CSIRO. Um, but we started talking about, you know, was there a way to adapt uh, this methodology of actually rapidly testing ideas and, uh, and solving problems with students and universities to work on real problems of national import. Uh, and we partnered with our Department of Defense and uh, in one program called Hacking for Defense and another called Hacking for Diplomacy uh, in year one. And now five years later, I, I think Hacking for Defense is uh, uh, approaching 50 universities in the, in the United States, all working on problems uh, given to them by our defense and intelligence community. That's great, Steve. So um, you, you talked about the, the method and, and, you know, we talked about your origins a little bit. So if people say, well, what does Silicon Valley really have to do with solving defense type of problems? So, so what are the similarities between maybe your experience in the military and, and the sort of, the, the aspects, the ways of thinking and the environment to Silicon Valley? How, how do these two worlds yeah. collide? So, so, so they intersect really, Jamie, on, it's very funny. I never thought of that question, the frame that way. It's an excellent one. They actually intersect in two different areas. One, the obvious, which is, uh, you know, the technologies that our defense are now dealing with are mostly driven by commercial companies. It's a big idea. Um, the defense industry has never had to deal with that before. And what I mean by that is AI, machine learning, autonomy, cyber, commercial access to space at scale, all that's being driven faster outside of military organizations than it is inside. And the people who are driving that are my students and your students and, you know, and, and startups and like small companies. And obviously DOD still has their own labs, but boy, that stuff is, is happening faster outside. And to get people inside the military connected to, to that is just like great learning is like, whoa, that's possible or that's what's going on. Because our adversaries are, have, have done this not by accident, but have fused civil and, and, and military and, and, uh, and academic uh, organizations uh, by fiat. Um, the second part though is, and I think equally important, is being able to get folks in the defense establishment to understand how um, innovators and, and startups work at speed. And I mean, with speed and urgency, um, being able to create something from nothing and being able to test multiple iterations. And, 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 and this is versus an organization like the military that for the last 50 years was happy to write requirements and you know, go through an acquisition process and build systems that would meet threats for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, those just are a, no longer predictable and, and the technology is obsolete by the time you deploy it. So the types of, of, of systems we need, organizational designs are closer and more akin to startups and, and, uh, and organizations that can move rapidly than they are the traditional organizations that were built when we had known threats and known technologies. Um, and so this cross fertilization, I, I think is just amazing. Um, it allows military organizations to understand the art of the possible and actually not just see students do it, but get involved themselves. And, and, and some of that kind of feeds back into their organization. Just as an aside, an unintended consequence, and I'll let Pete and Joe talk about this in, in some detail, was, was one I hadn't even thought about was that the connect rate between our students and the government organizations were just incredibly high. In fact, our last class at Stanford, eight out of our eight teams decided to continue mm -hmm. building what we call dual use companies. That is companies that serve both the military and commercial ventures. And I never thought that, you know, I thought that we would just educate them and, and then they would at least be knowledgeable about working with the government, but never raise their hand and say, we're in. And, uh, and just multiply that across 50 universities. And, you know, you now have 
you know, close to half a thousand teams a year mm. uh, doing this. It, it's over a couple of years that makes a dent. So Steve, from, from your experience, and you've seen this happen so many times now. So the traditional procurement process is very lengthy. It takes many years to develop a solution. So what do you realistically get from a 10 week activity that's going to add value to a, you know, to an end user? Yeah, so, so actually what you get, it was again, another big surprise, <laughs> at least for me though, though Pete knew this from day one was uh, that the problem almost always given to you by a government sponsor, whether it was in the military or even the state department and, and, and when we had active diplomacy, that is any of these mission driven things, almost always, though not always, almost always the problem is given to you on day one is not the problem at all. It's a symptom of a problem. And watching the teams and the sponsors actually work through, oh, this isn't the technology problem. This is a policy problem. Or, oh, mm. no, you know, this is, a, this is a symptom of two systems not connecting to each other. Or, no, this is not a, a symptom of a bad system. It was a symptom of a bad requirement. Um, learning that on both ends was just been amazing because it allows us to, to be incredibly efficient not just for the students, but for the government sponsors on how they're going to spend their time and money and be able to deliver, and here's the key part, solutions that are not only needed and wanted, but with speed and urgency. That is, once mm. you get cut through, no, 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 that's the symptom, but here's the problem. And can, if we could deliver these three features or this, like in a tenth of time, oh, well, that would actually solve 95% of what we've been asking for. Boom. And, and so... You don't get that by having meetings in a classroom or in a government organization. You get that by thinking that you have a starting point, but getting out of the building. And today that's mostly done virtually, but talking to stakeholders and beneficiaries and warfighters and every week building what we call minimum viable product, mm. whether it's a piece of hardware or a PowerPoint of a solution or an animation or some software and just putting it in front of people week after week you start converging on what these possible solutions could be and whether you've actually articulated the right problem. Um, it's exciting to watch in real time. Um, almost no one gets it on day one and mm. almost all of them get it by week, you know, six through 10. So it's an amazing uh, evolution. And the learning is yeah. done by the teams and the, um, and the sponsor, you know, the teaching team that is the part of the educators is just to kind of walk them through the framework, which is called the mission model canvas, about all the pieces involved about actually deploying stuff. We have a mantra in this class that the goal is deployment, not demos. You know, militaries across the world now have more demos than, you know, anybody ever needs, but you don't go to war with demos. You go to war with deployed systems rapidly. And, and that's what we teach is what is it that that we could get out to the field and what are the obstacles in doing that? It's not only building me the technology, but who has to buy in? Um, you know, who are the saboteurs? Who are the, you know, who, who are the, the people who, whose lives depend on it and who gets promoted um, if this thing succeeds? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's helpful, Steve. It's, uh, um, that makes me, I talk to people who uh, have participated in things like hackathons and other challenges and all that. And uh, um, one of the things there is, you know, what, what happens next or, you know, so when it's technology um, centric, could you just maybe talk a little bit about who's involved in one of these courses beyond the students and the, and the teaching team and, and how that helps um, move things forward? Sure. So, You, you know, number one, the, the, it starts with two ends of, of, of the pie. One is it starts with a university recruiting students who are interested in working on a set of some of the toughest and most interesting problems your country has, which, by the way, is the great recruiting technique. It's not just serve your country, but it's to work on if you're if you're pitching to computer mm -hmm. scientists or technologists, work on the toughest problems or the largest scale problems you ever see. But back in your Department of Defense or Ministry of Defense, you know, it's finding sponsors who go. Well, I'd like another view of this, or gee, we're kind of bottlenecked here, or gee, you know, leadership would really like to see is, you know, what's what's academia thinking about AI and machine learning, or you know, autonomy or drones or something else, and and is there another way to get some some views in this? And so 
it starts with soliciting problems from sponsors. The, the third group is that each of the teams are surrounded by mentors. Um, that is not just the instructors, but industry experts on technology or, or experts on government organization. Most of our students, at least at Stanford, most of them have no military background at all. So when you just say the word army, <laughs> you're thinking about people marching around with muskets. I mean, that's, you know, you have to explain what a military organization is. And so the mentors kind of help them through kind of the acronyms and buzzwords and whatever. And, and you'd be stunned how quickly they pick it up and are able to efficiently kind of start turning out potential solutions and putting them in front of the sponsors. And part of the class and part of the key idea is they need to learn more than their sponsor knows. And so they rapidly build out a network. They talk to over 100 to 150 mm. warfighters, stakeholders, beneficiaries, contractors, you know, politicians, if it requires funding, they could draw you, how does this go from a single funded demo all the way through a program of record? What's it gonna take to scale this? It's not just let me build the tech. And by the way, over whose dead body will this get deployed because it, removes billets for, and budget from them, or it conflicts with an existing contractor. Those are all part of teaching them about how to actually build something that gets deployed and, and what are the obstacles to doing that. Um, and, and, you know, I have to tell you that the, the, the biggest thing that's made this thing scale, I think, is not only that the program works, it works for the universities, it works for the defense department, but there's now a kind yeah. of a common understanding that we all kind of face a existential threat to democracy, whether it's in the United States or, or New Zealand or Australia or the UK or all the democratic nations of the world, and that our adversaries have figured out how to yoke together all components of their economic system in a, in a way that's quite frightening. Um, mm. And if we're all not going to be speaking Mandarin in the next 20 years, then we ought to figure out how to engage the other parts of our society that actually, surprisingly, are willing to get engaged. And this is Think of this, think of hacking for defense as the easiest on-ramp to engage uh, um, the part of the community in, in Australia that needs to get engaged to be thinking about um, how to help the government. Yeah, that's that's really, really great, Steve. And just whilst people are sort of thinking through that, so hacking for defense, the, the, the parent program of hacking for national mm -hmm. security in Australia started in 2016. Since that time, there's been more than 1,000 students taking the course more than 40 universities in the United States scaling to 50 uh, next year, scaling up to 24 universities in the, the UK. This is a huge effort tackling uh, more than 300 national security and defense problems. Um, it's great. So, hey, Steve, we might um, just uh, break there for a second, just shift um, shift shift focus. But just one final question. I, I know you love Australia. I know you, you're you know, passionate about uh, this place, but... You know, would you consider, would you come back as soon as you're allowed to travel, as soon as COVID restrictions, would you come back and would you accept an invitation to come back to, you know, a Hacking for Defence or Hacking for National Security class and listen to the final sort of presentations at some stage in the future? I, I, I'd love it. For those of you who don't know, my uh, my career started uh, five miles outside of Alice Springs. So so if I enjoyed spending a year there and, and I've since then, uh, gotten to enjoy uh, the rest of Australia. I've been Sydney and Melbourne and can been to Canberra a lot and spent some time in Tasmania. Um, there's lots of us Australia I haven't seen, so uh, I'm always looking for a good excuse to visit. Uh, it, it's a it's a wonderful country and uh, um, with a lot of shared values and uh, and shared interests. So uh, happy to get engaged and and thank you for the invitation, Jamie. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for all you did to, to get us to, to this point. So what we might do now is we shift to um, our next conversation, which is with Joe Felter. So Joe Felter, you want to say hi? So you pop up in the screen. He's yeah, Joe. sure, Jamie. Great, great to be here. Okay, so Joe's um, ex-army ex, ex uh, special forces, uh, served in multiple places, Afghanistan uh, and the like. Um, tell some stories about parachuting into Australia and um, missing the target. Um, but Joe is one of the co-creators of uh, Hacking for Defence. Um, he's also worked in the Pentagon, a very senior position, and continues to dialogue uh, with people, senior people in Australia. And I think that what I wanted to understand from you, um, Joe, with your strategic understanding of 
um, of of the world. What, why why is an international effort important? Why UK, USA, and Australia? Why, why do you want to extend this program into Australia? Yeah, well, thanks. Well, first, Jamie, just congratulations on what you're starting there. We're uh, really excited for you. Um, you know, obviously, great big shoes to follow with your your counterpart in UK, I see Ali on the line, but uh, I know you're going to do really well down there, and we're, we're here to support you 100%. Um, but to answer your question, you know, maybe from the, the big strategic picture, and I think Steve Blank touched on this a bit, but you know, we, we are we are in a in a competition right now. We we are there are those who have a shared vision for the future, uh, that want to see this rules based order endure. You know, that's allowed so much prosperity to 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 develop and, and flourish in, across the region, and those you know, particularly one country who have a different vision for the future. So, when I would say. Uh, you know, my job in the Pentagon traveled around the region to include Australia, um, which is some of the best parts of my job. Uh, I get the feeling that you know we are losing, but we haven't lost yet, and we we don't need to lose, and we don't we will not lose if we leverage our comparative advantages uh, more effectively. And that's you know we've got a when I say we, you know, our U.S. and U.K. You mentioned uh, and, uh, and and Australia, you know, treaty allies, you know, longstanding allies. You know, we have a very special relationship with. Uh, certainly both UK and Australia, and I'll focus on Australia now. Um, and that's what we need to leverage. You know, our, our, uh, our competitor, if you will, think of the allies and partners that they have across the region, you know, maybe North Korea, uh, maybe Pakistan, you know, not, not really promising. Um, but so I would say, you know, a strong Australia, that's, that's, that's not only in the interest of Australia, it's in the interest of the United States. It's in, in the interest of every country in, in the region that, that cares about, you know, defending state sovereignty. Um, so how do we build and help partner with Australia, UK, and other allies and partners to, to build those capabilities? Well, the traditional ways, you know, mill, mill to mill cooperation. But I would argue that, you know, what you're doing, what Ali's doing, what we're trying to do in the United States is a huge way to, to, to bring those comparative advantage to the table that, that certainly our competitors don't have. You know, if we can give more of our best and brightest, you know, students and universities, for example, an opportunity to contribute, to get involved, you know, to leverage their, you know, huge brains and creativity in ways that, that, that benefit, you know, our, our defense and, and security organizations. You know, that's huge. And I think that's going to, I think that's going to, you know, t tilt the balance, if you will. And, and I think uh, what, what, what uh, you know, Steve and, and Pete and, and the team are, are doing now, and now you and, and Ali and others, uh, this is a great example of how we're going to bring more resources to the table, uh, build our defense capabilities by harnessing the brain power and intellect and creativity, you know, of, of a tremendous resource, you know, our, our young people at our, at our top universities. So I'm, I'm a little more optimistic. Uh, I think, uh, I, I think once we do this more effectively, once we you know, leverage these programs, like you're, you're taking point on Australia, we're, we're going to see, uh, you know, we're going to see this rules-based order endure. We're going to, you know, our vision is, is shared, you know, it's not imposed and, and we're going to work with, you know, partners like Australia, UK and others to, to make sure that it endures. And it's uh, really exciting to see, see what you're doing down there, Jamie, and uh, can certainly yeah, drone on more, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that if you have some more questions. No, that's, um, that's, 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 that's really helpful, Joe. So just maybe just, you know, quite, what, what do you think the gap was? When, you know, when you sat around, when you had that conversation, you know, in the early days, what in your mind was the, the gap that you were filling with the, the Hacking 4 program? Yeah, well, I had a great opportunity because, you know, I, I got to know Pete Newell when he was still in the Army and we, we had a lot of shared experiences. I mean, he's, you know, war hero, Silver Star winner. Um, he was doing he was doing lean before I think he knew what formerly lean was as far as his work with the Rapid Equipping Force. Uh, but then I got to know, uh, you know, Steve Blank having my other foot in, uh, in academia. My sense was, you know, how do you connect it to? How do you, you know, connect our best and brightest in academia and, and give them the opportunities to work on these really tough and challenging problems like like Pete had done up up close and personal and in his professional career. Um, and then I think, you know, this collective epiphany, wow, what if this amazing and powerful methodology that, that Steve Blank had developed could be modified um, to the point where we could uh, help solve problems that the military has and, you know, our intelligence organizations, other government organizations have. So, so the gap, I think, was, you know, uh, maybe developing this method, or I should say modifying this powerful methodology so it could be applied to, to public sector problems. You know, when success isn't measured in revenue, but, but you know, impact and mission accomplishment. And somehow how we can, you know, when, when the other gap is how do we harness that, that brain power and, and creativity of our young people. And, and I'll just tell a quick story, Jamie, if this isn't going on too long, but you know, when Steve and Pete and I, we spent like six months writing this educator's guide, adapting from Pete's, or Steve's original one, building this class, we didn't know if any students were going to show up. I mean, this is Stanford. This is, you know, the, 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 the nickname, get rich you, you know, will, will students come and take a tough class, work hard, 
uh, to support the military, but you know, fortunately, our best and brightest did show up. I think because they're really uh, intrigued by by a really tough, tough working on some really tough problems. And and honestly, there, there are a lot of patriots out there, not not just U.S. citizens, but but individuals who wanted to get involved in public service. So so uh, it's kind of like that. If you've seen that that movie, you know, if you build a field, they will come. Um, so mm -hmm. that that gap was this field didn't exist. So hacking for defense, it created this field to to attract these young men and women in our top, this certainly at Stanford and now many other universities to, to come to the table and get involved and, and learn this powerful methodology that Steve had developed and start working on problems, you know, like it's, that Pete had done for his career and, um, and really make a difference. Um, you know, and I'm, those of you who know me personally, I get like to get on my soapbox, so I'll leave it at that. But um, a lot of gaps were filled there. And, 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 and Jamie, I know you're going to fill similar gaps down there in Australia for, for the common good. And, uh, you know, we'll we look forward to supporting you. No, thanks so much, Joe. And I, um, so what we do is we now move to our, our next guest, and that's uh, David Burt from UNSW, who is well known in the Australian innovation ecosystem. Uh, David Burt has worked uh, across the sector. He's lectured at uh, University of Sydney. Sydney. He's an expert in uh, innovation uh, and entrepreneurship. Uh, he's also well known for his work with Planet Arc um, and uh, CSIRO's on program and it's really been great working with David over the last few months as we've we've spun this up um, so welcome David you want to say hi so you pop to the center of people's screens thank you Jamie good morning everyone okay well thanks thanks David um, so David tell us a little bit more about what are UNSW's plans for hacking for national security in 2021 yeah, definitely. Thank you, Jamie. It's fantastic to be partnering with CMP on the program. Our plan is already in motion. So UNSW will run the first Hacking for National Security program with our students early next year. We've already identified the great academic staff, the educators who will deliver the program, which is Phil Hayes Sinclair and David Heslop, who are from our schools of business and medicine, respectively. And so we're already trying to bring the, the full weight of UNSW, trying to get those multidisciplinary teams, have students from different backgrounds um, collaborating together on, on the problems. Uh, we're currently recruiting that, that first batch of master's students as we speak. And our aim is to have the student teams allocated to problem sponsors and commencing their work together by the end of February, 2021. So David, I talked a little bit about your experience and your expertise. So tell me, why does UNSW need this program? Why, why you could do so many, why do you need this program? Yeah, so I think part of, part of where I'll go with the answer is, you know, when I pre was previously at the CSIRO scaling the ON program to about 35 Australian universities, we did that without a partner like CMP. And, you know, we took a lot of um, inspiration from Steve Blank's i program, which was, which was just amazing that we're able to leverage off of that. Um, but what's different with the Hacking for Defence program is for this to work, and especially for this to work at scale across Australia, there needs to be a trusted central partner like CMP that owns the relationship with the problem sponsors, helps educate them, helps enforce a quality standard consistent across the nation. So when I was at CSRO, we were able to structure the ON program such that we, we were able to, to have that mandate at a national level to, to enforce a quality standard, um, which was you know, through that combination of training and that kind of quality assurance. But when it, when it comes to the Hacking4 program and, and how do we deploy that at scale in Australia as, as Hacking for National Security, that can't be done by any one university. You know, we really need that independent organization that comes with the playbook, that comes with the global network, yeah. the relationships, especially given the subject matter, which is national security. It's not just an Australian thing. Um, and so there's really no room for lone wolves in, in this program. It's got to be a coalition and, it, and it's got to be done with, with partners. So that's really the fundamental difference with the ON program. We could scale that ourselves. Um, but given what we're trying to achieve here with hacking for national security, it's got to be done in, in a coalition and, and that coalition's got to be led by CMP. No, thanks, David. And just you know, for, for all the, the university educators out there, um, you know, that certainly is the plan that we would work with you. We will provide you a curriculum. We provide you the educator's guide and all the material you need to actually instantiate a Hacking for National Security course based on Hacking for Defence. So, Dave, something I, I've, I've learned what a generous person you are and how much time you've given me as we've worked through this. But along the way, you've told me, that, that generosity just doesn't extend to me. So do you want to tell me a little bit more about where UNSW sees themselves fit in and 
what, how would you work with other universities and where do you see your role as being the first, first to, to, to the, you know, through the gate here? Yeah, no, I'm super excited that UNSW is the first Australian university, but I so hope we're not the last. It's such a fantastic opportunity here to, you know, you know I, won't, I won't recover the ground that, that's, that, that Steve um, and Pete have already covered, but yeah, th- th- in terms of just the opportunity to activate so many new brilliant minds against those national security problems, you know, there is, you know, this is a really broad invitation for other Australian universities to join in. Um, such a fantastic opportunity to scale this program across Australia. Um, and that's, again, not something that UNSW can do alone. So, mm. so UNSW's commitment and, and my commitment is that we'll approach scaling the Hacking for program in Australia uh, the same way that Stanford approached it in the US, the same way that King's um, has approached it in the UK. You know, we'll, we'll be super open. We'll be sharing our learning. We'll be sharing our resources. Um, sharing our experience and, and really inviting those those other universities to come into the space. And as I think about the role that UNSW is playing here, it's not just running the program, it's it's helping the other Australian universities understand that this is this is easy to implement. This is low risk to implement because of the, the partnership and, and the experience that CMP brings. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of hard work to be done uh, to, to make it work, but if you know, it's I just love for Australian universities to hear the message that this is yeah. an easy and low risk way forward. That's great. So, David, you you, you flip between UNSW and, and I there a couple of times, and I just want to tease that out because I think there there is a fair amount of as I've learned more about it's a fair amount of David involved in here. There's a fair amount of motivation. So, do you want to talk to for you as someone with no experience in defence, no great what is motivating you as an individual and, and what might that mean and how might that motivate others along the way? Yeah, great question. So yeah, I don't come from a defense background. I haven't served as part of the military through building the ON program. It was, it was really fortunate we were able to strike a close partnership with DST, Defense uh, Science Technology Organization, which is sort of the, 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 almost the DARPA of Australia, if you will, for the American colleagues on the line. And that was super powerful because what we were able to do then is we're able to work with them to help bring scientists kind of behind the wire, like into the tent and, and start to expose some of Australia's best scientists to, to defense problems and defense stakeholders. So I saw the power of that. And so, you know, for me personally, that's that's something I'd, I'd love to do again, but this time with, with university students. Um, uh, another sort of thing I'd, I'd personally love to be involved with is helping really raise the, the level of maturity in Australia around the national security conversation. What happens a lot is, is people hear national security and they think just defense. Um, but that's really not the case. And, you know, something like food security is a national security issue. Energy security is a national security issue. And, you know, Australia has been quite fortunate in its history that food security and energy security have, have never really been a problem. That might not be the case in the future, whether it's from external actors, whether it's from something like climate change. Um, you know, biosecurity is national security as the world has just got a really important lesson taught to us by COVID-19. So, you know, personally, selfishly, I'm really excited to, help be part of changing mm. the conversation in Australia around national security. No, thanks so much, David. It's been great working with you. And so what I might do is we'll, we'll move now to um, our, our final guest before we maybe open up for um, just a little bit of interplay between, between them. So the, the final uh, person in, in this mix is, is Pete Newell. Um, I think Joe's already given a little bit about uh, background to Pete, but Pete really is, um, a war hero, a silver star winner, um, Battle of Fallujah in Iraq, various operations, um, the real driving force behind BMT and CMP, um, but a wonderful, a wonderful person, a great empowering leader, and a and a great individual to to work with. And you know, just personally, Pete, I thank you for your support and your encouragement to get us to to this point. But from all your experience, Pete, what motivated you, drove you to this point, um, working with hacking for defense and that, can you tell us what's in this for the operator? What's in this for the end user? What does it look like for them? So I, I you know, first, Jamie, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, I'm gonna take two seconds to say congratulations yeah. on, on pulling this together. And, I, and I'll tell you the rest of you. Um, I'm trying hard to contain myself because I've been after Jamie for probably five years to get him to take this on. And 
I consider this a massive success that we finally got Jamie Watson to, to take on his new life mission. So I, I'm really, um, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of this team. It, everybody that has pulled this together in the US, the UK, and now Australia, it's such a, just an incredible opportunity. And, and quite frankly, it's, um, it's rewarding and a little daunting sometimes to realize the, the types of problems we're about to take on. Yeah. Um, I think that, that Stephen both and Joe both have said it very accurately. Um, there is no shortage of really nasty, hard problems in a world that need to be solved. Um, there is in some cases a lack of imagination uh, for finding new ways to solve them. Fortunate for us, our universities are full of young, bright, energetic, hungry, aggressive young men and women who want to have an impact on the world. And, and simply through the Common Mission mm -hmm. Project and through uh, H4X and the various programs, we've found a way to put them to work doing something that's both meaningful to them and provides a means of educating them on the types of skills that they need to carry into the workforce for the future. So there, there's so many different aspects of, of hacking for national security or, or H4X that, that sing to this crowd. Yes, um, it is the, the lifeblood of this platform is problems. Good, hard, nasty problems that come from, you know, the front lines of the world, whether it's the uh, health networks or, or the military or uh, diplomacy or anything else. Um, but, but the idea that you can curate them into things, and prioritize them and place them on a platform, you know, based on um, the lean startup methodologies and actually churn out um, minimum viable products that you can determine what to invest on and what not is it's just an incredible asset to any country. I think it's even more important now that we look at, at how tightly bound um, allies are. And we're talking now about a massive network that, that works across three continents today. And it'll very rapidly expand to, to other allies, I have no doubt, in the very near future. But, but that's the kind of platform the world needs to go after some of the hard things. So just solving the problems is, is reason enough for us to be here. But the fact that we're investing in young men and women and providing them an opportunity to actually learn about and perform a national public service for their country that will help them actually get jobs that are meaningful is, is simply um, beyond the moon what we have the potential to do. So I, you know, I, I would say all of you, thank you, thank you, thank you again and again and again, and Jamie, for you uh, stepping up and offering to do this. Um, I think is, uh, as we have proven the methodologies that we have uh, built and learned about inside these university programs are now being applied inside large enterprise organizations and helping them actually move away from innovation theater to the point where they're actually making a difference. And I think that that's um, incumbent on all of us to, to take that very powerful platform on and continue that mission. Mm, no, thanks. Thanks so much, Pete. What I might do is we'll, um, I, I want to do add to your thanks to a, a bunch of people to thank um, for, for getting to this, to this point. And then I'll circle back around. Um, I think via Joe, I think Joe wants to, to chip in and I'll, um, but you know, it, if it takes a, you know, if it takes a village to raise a family, I think it, you know, it takes an ecosystem to, to raise an entrepreneur. And I've certainly experienced that as we've spent months getting to, this point and as Pete says it really has been a, a five-year journey it's a five-year journey that started with um, uh, my boss back in the day um, Jan Drobik who said I want you to go out and explore um, where you think Australia needs to be what capability does Australia need in the future uh, to be um, competitive and I, and I said to him at the time I, I think we need to invest in innovation and look at um, this organic maker movement and what entrepreneurs Bring to the table and that's what led us to ultimately to, to this point but just in bringing us to the point where we're launching the common mission project in beam t in australia today I, I really want to acknowledge the leadership of beam t and common mission project for actually having the vision 
and and uh, you know committing to this and the great team at uh, CMP in the states and in the UK and BMT for all their support. Um, I, I want to thank my um, counterparts in the UK, Ali Hawks. I, I said to her this morning, she's been the wing beneath my wings. Has certainly been, you know, in my camp and advocated and and really helped me to to to, to push through. Uh, and Emily and the team in the US who've just provided lots of material and support. Uh, I got a great team of advisors, which we've heard from David Burt, who's just been, you know, called me up, you know, on the weekends at any time to say, hey, tracking Jamie, what are you thinking? Where are we going to make sure we're getting this this right? Um, Peter Pad down at UTAS. Peter Pad has, you know, been consistently messaging me, tracking how I am and, and leaning into this. Peter is a uh, Hacking for Defence qualified and certified uh, educator and is, is ready to go down there. Peter's been great. Uh, another great colleague is Colin Tan. Colin Tan runs Access Agile here in Australia and Colin has been a great sounding board of many things that we've moved towards, towards this. I also want to thank the CMP board and that's uh, Mike Smith uh, and uh, Melissa Cabin who uh, have provided me great counsel in terms of all the logistics of setting up a not-for-profit in Australia, which for those who have ever done that, and I know David Bird has, that's not uh, an insignificant effort to get a not-for-profit up and uh, up and running. Uh, also want to thank, I have spoken to um, more than 100, probably pushing towards 200 people along this journey to understand who's going to benefit from this program, to get feedback, to pivot and to explore. And my understanding of what is needed from for Australia and what's going to work in Australia and how we're going to deliver our Hacking for National Security program is based on extensive beneficiary discovery. So we are practicing what we, we preach here in terms of we talk about this methodology and I've applied this methodology to get us to this point and to all the people who have um, been along the journey and, and spent most of them about an hour, some even two or three hours talking to me and telling me what they what they think. And I also want to thank all of you who have turned up today. I think we're tracking about 70 people and it's going to take, you know, this many people plus to run a successful program like this well into the future. And um, I want to invite you to, to continue in this journey. I think Logan's got a, there's a link we'll put up which you can click on, you can go and register, do some training for uh, how to conduct hacking for national security programs as either an educator, as a program sponsor, or as a mentor. And I certainly encourage you, there's the link. That's on our website, commonmission.org.au under the training uh, the, the training uh, area. So I think, Joe, I'll flick to you before I hand back to um, uh, P Pete to officially cut the, the virtual ribbon on the Common Mission Project in Australia and maybe uh, Steve, if you've got any final points, but we'll go to Joe, Joe Felter, you've got something to, to pitch in. Yeah, thank, thanks for giving me the chance, Jamie, uh, maybe light things up a little bit, but you know, as Pete said, we've been, uh, Jamie's been on, on the radar of, uh, you know, the hacking defense effort for, for almost five years. Um, I remember going down to, to Adelaide with, with Pete, uh, gosh, it must've been 2017 trying to get things going, but, but clearly uh, we weren't uh, up to the task uh, like, like you are, Jamie, but, just want to take take a take you back to a time when right after we taught our first uh, hacking for, for defense class in 2016. Um, if you know Steve Blank, he doesn't do anything that doesn't scale. He's just a, it, it's not going to get his interest if there isn't an opportunity to scale it. So we 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 decided in the weeks after the first successful hacking for, for defense class to hold a an educators course. You know, try to build the insurgency and, and attract some some folks to to, to learn about hacking for defense and, and evangelize it and take it back to their university. So. Jamie shows up, you know, and being the, the friendly Australian, the most popular guy in the class. But at the end of the, the educators course, we asked the, the participants to talk about some lessons um, and what they got out of it and what, what you know, what they were going to do with it. And uh, I'm going to see if I can screen share this. And I Logan, Logan, I'm going to show you, you know, the Americans are all putting these fancy PowerPoint slides together. But, uh, you know, Jamie sketches something out on a, basically a bar napkin, as you know, you'd expect from a good, good Aussie, you know, with a um, I won't, I won't go there, but uh, everyone knows me, knows I love Australians and that, <laughs> but let me see if I can share this. And, and cause uh, this is what Jamie put up on the screen right back in 2016. So we should have known then that he was destined for greatness with hacking for defense, but let, let me see if I can get there. Um, so does that, is that coming up? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So this, uh, this is Jamie's final slide for the 2016 educators course. Uh, um, presentation. 
So, so check it out if, you, if, you, if those of you can see it. I mean, there's some there's some amazing. Uh, you, you see the, the the mission model canvas there highlighted. Um, you see, you know, Steve's I Corps how that kind of translated. I think that's probably a, maybe a picture of Pete Newell at, at, at the ref and, and some initials there. Um, you look at the, uh, the 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 chemistry set there for experimentation. I mean, there's a lot that went into this. Basically, this is hacking for defense in one small. Uh, diagram. So, so uh, uh, I think Stephen, Pete, and I we saw this. I got this guy's special. Um, he he knows what it takes. He gets it. And uh, so I'll just leave it with that, Jamie. We 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 knew it then, and you've certainly lived up those expectations. And and I know that you're the team you're going to build, and you know that the this organizations you're going to impact, the problems you're going to solve, and then the students you're going to influence and, and empower. It's just going to be extraordinary. And, and you got a direct line back here to Stanford, back to CMP. You know the mothership at BMNT here in Palo Alto, and a. We're all, we're all behind you. And so congratulations and thanks for the chance to, uh, to join you today. Uh, thanks so much, Joe. Um, uh, I'll try to stop sharing here. Stop sharing. Uh, <laughs> Steve, you got any final thoughts uh, before we hand back to Pete? Yeah, just a, just a couple of things, uh, Jamie. You know, if you're an educator listening uh, uh, to this, uh, I just want to share with you that it's, it's probably going to be one of the most rewarding classes you're going to teach and put on in your university. Um, it's going to be rewarding as you watch students accomplish things you never thought was possible in that short period of time. You're going to see them leave their class with not only having done a thing, but the set of tools that will last them the rest of their careers, and they will remember you for that. Um, if you're a sponsor, you're, you're going to have the ability to inject something into your organization, whether it's in defense or intelligence or somewhere else that you might have been trying to beat down the doors forever, but until someone else outside the building can show your peers and your leadership that this is possible, and that more importantly, if students could do it, for God's sake, we could do this too. Um, and then for your country, um, you're all gonna be adding something to help make Australia a more safe and secure place to continue to live in. And so the Common Mission Project and everybody involved on this call and everybody you know, in the background behind the curtain, it has, has made it just seamless for you guys to do this. Um, you know, and, and company and have, have scaled this now to multiple countries with, as Joe said, with Jamie's leadership and others, um, this is kind of a no brainer. And so I encourage all of you to get involved for, for all the reasons I, I've just talked about. And, and probably at the best is you'll go to sleep uh, every night knowing that you've made the world a better place. Yeah, thanks so much, Steve. Uh, David, any any final thoughts, mate? Uh, it's just fantastic to bring the, the global network to Australia. I think again, you know, many of the speakers have emphasized part of the alliance. The alliance approach is is how we're going to win, and uh, just the fact that we can draw from the experience of what comes before, and, and we can put that to work and localize it in Australia. It's just such a fantastic opportunity. Thanks so much, Dave. So, Pete, that brings us to the end of uh, our. Um, our formal session, apart from you launching, I'll be staying in by here and I'll stay online for people who want to ask me questions and continue to dialogue. So Pete, over to you, you can cut the ribbon. So I'll take the last two seconds, Jamie. Um, yeah, and I, I want to congratulate you on pulling the group together. Um, I, I think, you know, for all of you, the what we've realized over the years is if you want anything done, it's really going to be the product of a tightly connected, trusted network. And, and what the hacking for defense, hacking for national security, the Common Mission Project, BMT, what we have learned to do is build very unique networks around specific issues. And, and the beauty of what you can do with this is you build these really resilient teams of people and networks around you know, specific things that you want to work on. And they actually see the light of day in terms of transitioning into something that truly has an impact, whether it's a change in policy or whether it's a piece of technology that shows up on the battlefield. Um, I will tell you, you know, having been at this for a lot of years, this is the most professionally rewarding thing I do mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And it's the one place that I see change happen from. So, you know, God bless all of you for being here. But, but I tell you, as Steve said, it's truly rewarding to get involved. It's exhausting to teach the class. It's exhausting to get caught up in it. But I tell you, I learn more from these students every time they get involved than I do anyplace else. So um, I, I really, I think we're blessed to have all of you online. 
I hope that we have a chance to see you face to face uh, in Australia in the near future, uh, because I really look forward to getting back down there and, and going back to work with all of you. Um, Jamie, once again, congrats on, on getting this one up off the ground. No, thank you. So we'll let the guests go. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll stay online. If Logan, you want to put that link back up for people who want to click on there and register for some training or some more information, that'd be great. So thank you everyone for your time. Thanks for your support. Let's go make it happen.